Oh, yeah. All right, John. Would you do me a favor and just start reading at least maybe through verse 7, maybe? Cool. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Sorry, bro. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Oh, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we talk about this a lot in this church, right? Most of us have it down pat. I mean, at least in, at least cognitively. Yeah, right? We got it in we got it in our brain. Amen. We need it. We definitely need it in our heart. Amen. What, what, what I wanted to say about this is, is that because what I want to talk to you about tonight is part two of King, the words of a king. Amen. But whenever Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, he's speaking as a king to citizens that want to be part of his kingdom. But none of this has happened yet. Right. And so he's explaining to them how it is expected that his people are going to live for him, how the actions and the fruit and the manifestation of their lifestyle in the real world is supposed to look. And definitely we could say in, in compare really more contrast to the world that is around it. Amen. And so what we know is this, is that the first time when we were born in Adam, we were born with a sinful nature. The word of God teaches us that. Um, and, 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 you know, we use this scripture a lot, but in, in uh, Genesis chapter five, verse three, it says, after 130 years, Adam had another son, and he was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. And so that would have been after the fall. And so there's a, there's a sinful nature that is in the heart of man. Scripture says, uh, you know, we talked about that recently, about Romans chapter 3, that there's none good, no, not one. Their throats are an open sepulcher, like left alone without God's intervention. Man, God, man is not going to go towards God. He's going to live in a fallen state and then there's some really ugly, a lot of ugly, corrupt things that are in it. Amen. And unfortunately, even sometimes as believers, some of those things show up. All right. And so, but according to Romans 6, that when we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, we might not have known this, right? We might not have known this pictorial representation. I know I didn't. Whenever I got saved, the Twin City Gospel so long ago, I didn't know anything about this. I just knew that something was stirring my heart and I needed to give my heart to Jesus. It was the night. It was time. It was the coming home time. Amen? And whenever I prayed that, though, what I'm trying to let you know is, is that according to the Bible, this is what happened. In the spirit realm, right there. Boom, in Christ. Boom, dead in Christ and buried with him. Boom, resurrected. New life, new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? And, and, and you've been you've been regenerated according to the word. By the way, I just want to let y'all know. I know y'all some busy people, but y'all been missing some really good Bible studies on Sunday nights. The fellowship and the, just the discussion of the scriptures has been, in my opinion, phenomenal. And just really like bringing people. I just have something to say. You know what would be so cool if you ever do a podcast? Yeah, we should do that. That would be should. really cool because... A lot of people do miss. Yeah, that. we should pull that. We should try to pull that off. Amen. That Thank you. That's so a great cool. idea. That's the, like the big draws a lot of people. Yeah, watch. we should do that. Praise God. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna work on that. I don't know who's gonna do what and how we're gonna do it, but we'll, we're gonna pray. Praise God. Deep Somebody deep else said something. About it. Yeah, it's been good. Praise God. All right. Thank you for that. And uh, so, so the old man has been has been has died in Christ. Amen. And uh, and the new man has been resurrected. Amen. And um, and so now because of the new position in Christ, 
Uh, you've been clothed in his righteousness. Galatians 3.27 says that those of you that have been baptized into him, you've been clothed with him and you've put him on. Okay. And so, so what we need to understand is that we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Now, because of the fact that we're righteous in the eyes of God, that, that allows the Holy Spirit, amen, to flow into our lives. That allows the grace of God to have its way in our hearts and in our lives. And, and it's really the person of the Holy Spirit that does the work on the inside of us. He's the one. He, he if you will, is the potter's hands on the earth. Amen. And, and he's the one that's molding uh, this piece of clay as we learn to yield and submit to him. All right. So I just wanted to make sure that we understood that none of the stuff that we're going to read and talk about tonight can happen without the work that Jesus did at the cross and without the continuous flow of the grace and the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. And, and us also, there is a big part to the free will of man. And that is the part, you know, where we, where we coin in here with the Holy Spirit. That's the Greek word for felt, joint participate. When we joint participate and submit and yield to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I can't really tell you enough how important the word of God is in your life. Because the word of God, again, is a mirror to discern to you the difference of what between your own soul and your and the spirit of God and to reveal to you. Amen. Now listen, I mean, we've been doing a lot of teaching on a lot of things lately. And it's just really sticking with me. And I wanted to say that between the, the mirror of the word that will discern your heart and the, 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 the fruit of your mouth. You got some mirrors, my friend. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? What, what do you mean the mirror of your mouth? Well, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so as we're in the word of God and it's mirroring to us the heart of God. See, that's what we learn in the word of God. We learn the heart of the Father. Amen? We, and, and Jesus is the express image of the Father. Right? And so when we see him and when we hear his words, we're seeing the Father. Amen. And so when we get the word of God on the inside of us, we see the character and the nature of God. And then whenever and then and it should witness to us whether or not we are lining up with the word of God. And then again, we have this thing that I just said where the words that we speak. OK. Amen. Will show us what is in us. Now I thank the Lord that my words are getting better. Amen. I thank the word, Lord, that my words are lining up more and more with the Word of God. But look, we all fall. We still fall short. Lord, help us. We're a work in progress. Amen. All right. So last week uh, was part number one, the words of a king, and it was the Sermon of the Mount, and we talked about poor in spirit. Remember that? I'm not going to belabor this review. I promise you. But one of the things we learned is this: is that is that whenever a person is poor in spirit, he said, unless you come unto me as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. He teaches us that, that through his scripture, that as he was dependent upon the Father, we also must be dependent upon him. Poor in spirit is not independent. Poor in spirit is dependent and understands that they must yield to the will of God and that they must trust in the Lord. Amen. That was number one. The blessed are those that are poor in spirit. Uh, number two is blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Right. And we talked about like I did a quick word study and almost every single time the word mourn was used in the New Testament, it was related to death or some type of a tragedy. I got to tell you that the Lord wants his people to mourn over what he mourns over. I don't think that that's a stretch to say that. I mean, okay. And he wants his people called by his name. See, because when we become kingdom minded, when we begin to seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, our heart becomes his heart. His will becomes our will. Amen. And our heart starts to beat like his. Listen, he's mourning because the human race is dead. The human race is dead in their sin. And I used Jesus as an example last time of how it said Jesus wept. And I just want to remind you, he knew that Lazarus was coming up out the grave. So the issue was not whether or not physical death was making him weep. That didn't make him weep. It was the fact that the people were they were so sorrowful. They were, he could see the misery. He could see their own mourning because he knows what sin has done to the human race. And the Lord wants you and I to feel what he feels. Just like he made Hosea go marry Gomer. He wants you and I to feel 
What he feels. Y'all know who Gomer is? Yeah, y'all know who Gomer is. <laughs> I gotta say that. I was messing with my brother the other day. So, praise God. Gomer was Hosea's wife that had, the Lord told him to marry her because she had cheated on him. Okay? Or she was going to cheat on him. And, and, and I believe that with all of my heart that the Lord wanted a prophet to understand what his heart feels like whenever his people that are called by his name go in an opposite direction of his will for their lives. So blessed are those that mourn. Praise God for they shall be comforted. Amen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I talked about the fact that Jesus, whenever they came behind him, and he said, whom do you seek? And he said, I am. And they fell to the ground. Amen. He said, in another place, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels? We said that's between 36 and 48,000 angels. But even in the midst of all of that, I'm not saying he did this, but this is kind of like what it was after they fell down. He put it, he said, all right, put the cuffs on this guy. See, meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is actually strength under submission. Matter of fact, the Greek word was used in the Greek language to describe war horses. I mentioned that to you on how they had been trained to be submissive and to, to submit to authority. Amen? And, and, and it's important that you and I understand that. That's, that's, that's true meekness. Amen? You know, how does that play out in the real world? That plays out in the real world that even though somebody comes against you and persecutes you and does whatever they do to you, that you don't have to respond that way because you know who you are in Christ. You know who you are in Christ. Amen? And, and look, I'm not going to tell you you're going to remember it tomorrow, but sooner or later, if you'll let the Word of God get into your heart and in your mind, you're going to start to recognize the patterns that are happening. You're going to start to recognize the, the words that are coming out of the abundance of your heart. You're going to start to recognize these things. Amen? And as you yield to the Holy Spirit, He's going to give you the strength. Amen? We, we said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Jesus said, I got food to eat that you don't even know about. He said, my food is to, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And so now we're at number five. Blessed are the merciful. So this is Matthew chapter five, verse seven. Matthew 5, verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, I wanted to learn from my master, from his words and his other interactions within the Gospels. What did you, what did you, what did you mean by this? You know, we have a whole breadth of word from, from God through the ages, but, but specifically from Jesus, like, when, when you said this, like this is your first sermon, right? He hadn't gone to the cross yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't been, hasn't been deposited in the hearts of people yet. And he's up here on this mountain and he's preaching this message. And then it's like, what did you mean by this? So I'm gonna, I want to go back and I want to think about this. So I don't want you to turn to this, but in Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus was reclining at the, ta at the, at the table in the house and there were many tax collectors and sinners, and they were reclining with him and his disciples. And then the Pharisees saw this, and he said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous but sinners. Yes. And I gotta tell you something. Amen. If you think that Jesus was trying to say those Pharisees didn't need a doctor, Come you're on. misinterpreting Amen. what he was saying. Amen. He was because you see what was really happening is is that they thought they were okay. They didn't realize they were sick. You see, a lot of times when a person is physically sick and their body is ailing them, they know that they need a physician. But this, this is one thing I want to tell you something, is that a lot of times when people are bound up with various types of sin, they know that they're sick, right? And I, I just want to say that. A person that's bound by drugs knows that he's sick. A person that's bound by lust knows that he's sick. A person that's bound, okay, they know that they're sick. But this one sin right here is very, very tricky, and it makes it difficult to know that you're sick because it's a spirit that blinds you because the pride part of it actually makes you think you're the one that's right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. 
And you can't even see what's really going on. And that was the issue with the um, with these Pharisees that were that were happening, right? And so, you know, many times people offer mercy when it's convenient for them. But when a situation affects them personally, something happens to their heart and the opposite of mercy comes out of them. And instead of mercy, it's vengeance and retaliation. The problem with the Pharisees is that they can't see. Now, what's interesting is if you do a research, you've heard the word phylacteries in the New Testament. If you've never heard it, then, then I'm just going to tell you phylacteries. Okay, P-H-Y-L-A-C-T-E-R-I-E-S. And what phylactery was, it was a box that they would wear on their head. I don't want to spend too much of time on this, but they put scripture in it. If you read about tradition, it said that there was a group known as the Bleeding Pharisees. What that meant was, was that they made their, that's what Jesus said, you make your phylacteries broad. You remember that? And whenever he was like, whenever he was chastising the man, you make your phylacteries broad. And then he goes on to say, you bunch of whited tombs, you're filled with dead men's bones. You clean the outside of the cup and the inside is full of filth. All right. He said, you make broad your phylacteries for a show of men. They, they say that they would make them boxes so big on their head that it would actually mess up their vision and they couldn't see where they were going. And they were bumping into things in the walls and blood was streaming down their face. And it was like, they were like oh, there's one of the bloody, bleeding Pharisees. He's really holy. Give it, let him have his way. And it's an outward sample of some type of religiosity. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Blinded. Blinded by foolishness. Okay, that's what the spirit of pride will do to us. It will blind us and we cannot even see what's really going on on the inside of our hearts and in our minds. People like that, that will, will begin to justify our actions by making decisions on what we believe is right for us. Because in our mind, what happens whenever the spirit of pride comes on it, we believe we're the right one. And everybody, nobody's... Everybody's vulnerable to this. We believe that we're the right one. And we can't see that we might be part of the problem. See? But whenever and people like this, what's happening is, is that the word of God's not, the essence of God's word is not penetrating the heart. And the heart has, the religious heart has become prideful and callous, but it doesn't even know it. See, when mercy is lacking, religious religion becomes formality, just a formality, going through the motion. That's what he said. He said, I don't desire. He said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And in Hosea, he was quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. You don't have to go to it. But he said, in Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So, so, so this is the quotation of the Old Testament out of Hosea. And, you know, I was looking at Leviticus. In Leviticus 19.18, it says this. I think I'm in the ESV version. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, look at this. Oh, yeah, get, get me on Leviticus 19.18. Sorry, I'm moving too fast. Leviticus 19.18. You are worthy of it all. I want y'all to see it. Praise God. You shall not take vengeance. Can, is, is that the ESV? Uh, yes. Okay. I guess I gave you the wrong one. All right. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge. Same words. Against the sons of your own people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at that last part right there after the colon. I am the Lord. <laughs> wow. I mean, I don't know that I ever noticed that before. But it's like, I am the Lord. I have spoken and I am the Lord. Now, now this is really big stuff right here, my friend. And, and I don't think that we can move too quickly. Because what the scripture says right here is, is that you shall not bear a grudge. The, 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 the word in the American dictionary says a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past insult or injury. God says you are not to be filled with resentment. You're not to be holding a grudge. I mean, did Jesus hold a grudge against you when he went to the cross? No. And the heart of the Lord is saying you cannot do that. Another, the, the other word, avenge or vengeance, it, it, it said to inflict 
harm in return for injury or wrong done to oneself or another. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You did me dirty, I'm going to do you dirty. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is saying, blessed are the merciful. And he's saying that my people called by my name are supposed to be merciful. But, but the people of the world, they're like, you do me dirty, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna do you dirty. See, and I keep going back to this in my own heart, and I keep thinking, do you really believe that God can take care of you? I, I mean, I had conversations and I can remember it like it was yesterday, sitting in a car talking with somebody probably 15 years ago. And that person was sitting there telling me, God's my defender, but yet they were defending themselves as they were telling me. And listen, I'm not picking on them because I know I've done it myself. It's not your job to defend yourself. And defensiveness is a sign and a symptom that something's not right. That we're not learning how to really yield to the Lord. And we're not learning how to really trust Him. This is something that the Lord's been dealing with me about. Amen. You don't, like, when are we going to get to the place where we don't have to take matters into our own hands? And we don't have to, we're not going to sit here and believe lies about, about what's spoken about us, but we don't have to get all messed up over it. Praise God. You know, you should, we should learn to expect that if we do anything for the Lord, that we're going to get some repercussions from it. There's a, there's a spirit in this world that's against the spirit of God. All right, look at this, man. You can turn to this one if you don't mind. This is in the King James Version. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43. And we'll go all the way through 48. Matthew 5, starting at 43. You have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, it's kind of hard to really let these kinds of words sink into our heart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, no. I mean, have we really been living this way? I'm just asking. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> For he made, look, look, I thought this was really good. I'm, I'm seeing these things so much more clearly. He is the, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans, that's another word for tax collectors, who they thought were very vile, by the way. Tax collectors were looked at as really the ho most horrible people in society. Why? Because they, they took money from their own people and, they, and they, you know, it made their life harder. So, so don't even the tax collectors do the same thing? And he says this, and if you salute your brother only, what do you more than anyone else? Do not even the tax collectors do this also? But you therefore... But be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Yes. And, and you know, but yet at the same time, people come against us. And he's saying, he's saying, this is how you're supposed to treat your enemies. And, and the Father in heaven is saying, you know, I was thinking about something while I was reading this earlier about Judgment Day. Not so much for Christians on this deal, but really on people that aren't believers. And, and I was thinking, you know, people are going to, I don't know how much talk there's really going to be, but just imagine in your mind that there's some kind of conversation that goes on. And they got to stand at the great white throne judgment, and they hear the pronouncement of judgment on their life. And I could see this guy that had, you know, I don't know, just making up 500 acres of farmland, and he was wealthy his whole life. You know, and he's standing there, and he's like, this isn't fair. I was a good person. I did this, and I did that, and you know, no. You know, I mean, I, I, I did all these things. No, no, sir, you didn't. And what you don't understand is this, is that the very 500 acres that you have wasn't even yours to begin with. It was my property. But I put in you the ability to, to think according to farmland principles. I put in you the, the hands 
that, that were able to work the land and the, to make the proper decisions and you blessed and you flourished and I even allowed the rain to fall upon your land. You produced some of the largest tomatoes this side of, I don't know, Mississippi. And in addition to that, your sugar crane crops just brought you all kind of money. And even do you remember that year that you found natural gas on your property? No, I was good to you. And, and even that, you wanted your daughter to start doing barrel racing, and you hired that guy to teach her how to do it, and he was my servant. And I said to him, he told your daughter about me, and she told you about me, and you said, oh, no, and no, sir, you're, you're standing in judgment. You're standing in judgment, and, and I just want you to know that, that what a good God. What a good God, and he's saying that you and I are to be the same way towards those that despitefully use you, those that treat you improperly. And so what I'm trying to say is this, is that whenever these things are going on in our lives and we find ourselves wanting to have vengeance and we find ourselves holding a grudge, and do you know what it feels like to hold a grudge against somebody? When you look at them, you don't like them. When you're looking at them, you're thinking all kinds of things about them. You think that like, some of y'all probably looking at me like that. No, maybe not. Yeah, I know y'all. Hopefully y'all love me. But if you are, it's not right. And you don't want to go to your grave with that in your heart. That's, that, you, that's, that, that's a sign of bitterness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. So that was, while they're turning there, that was mercy. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Praise God. That word pure means to be purified by fire or like a vine cleansed by pruning so that it's made fit to bear fruit. Fire is never comfortable. Actually, we had a conversation earlier I had a conversation earlier there, and they were talking about the fire, right? And about how fire consumes unbelievers, but fire refines God's people. And so many times we find ourselves in the midst of the fire. That's, you know, I'm starting to realize, man, in some of these Bible studies we've been having in the conversations that we had even last week, we were talking about the chastening of a father and how these, these situations occur in our lives. And he's a good father because he's committed to getting us to the place that he desires us to be. And he allows the fire to come and he allows the trial and the tribulation to come. He allows us to face these situations and circumstances so that he can break us down and bring correction into our hearts and into our lives. It's a part of a pure, it's a purifying of what he's wanting to do as he's producing in us what he desires to, to produce in us. It's important that we become pure. Yes, amen. His word talks to us about walking in purity. Amen. And it can only be done because you're born again. And the grace of God's flowing in your life. And the, and the grace of the Holy Spirit is producing life in you. And the grace of the Holy Spirit is conforming you into the image of Jesus. But you've got to yield to that. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like, you know, I feel like some, some, you know, I get concerned too. I get concerned about young people that are raised in church, but sometimes I get concerned about church folk too. That, well, how Jesus said, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you people? That, that, that hearing you never heard and seeing you never saw and that your heart became fat because you, you sat there and you heard the word of the Lord and you assumed that it wasn't talking about you. And that it causes a callous to take place. The Lord, the Lord believes in, in purifying our hearts. It says in Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 through 4, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands. What you, that's your actions. That's, that's, how, that's what you're doing on the earth. Right? What, how you, what you're performing, what your work looks like, what do, I'm talking about, like how you handle your business, your actions. And then, and then 
He who has clean hands and a pure heart, your motives. I'm going to tell you right now, believers need to pay attention to the motives of their heart. There's a scripture that talks about where he will judge the motives of men's hearts. That's serious, serious business, my friend. He sees. He sees what's in us. He knows what's in us. Nothing is hidden from his eyes. And, and, and that's how we're going to be, we're going to be judged on that. And, and part of that is, is, is judging, it's judging us. It's, and it's, and it's, and it's discerning us. And you know the word discerning, the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than the two-edged sword, it divides asunder, joint uh, from marrow and soul from spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That word discern is, is the word criticos, where we get the word critical. It's critiquing. The word of God critiques us. See, that's where the, going back to those Pharisees, when we've got pride, we can't even see ourselves. That's why God uses the trials to break us down. To break us down so that he can go, because he loves us. <laughs> He's a father. What, what kind of a father doesn't chasten his child when they're waiting? Yes, yes. Good fathers, they, they bring discipline. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Aren't you grateful that God has brought discipline into yeah, your life yes. at times when you weren't right, when you weren't walking right with him? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> verse, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. So we're talking about the heart right now. We're talking about blessed are those that pure in heart, for they will see God. And in Matthew 22, 37 says, Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Praise God. He wants it all. Amen. I like that song that Micah sings. See, he, you won't relent until you have it all. Amen. He, he's committed to our heart. He's Because you know what? And I'm going to get into it here in a second because that's his spot. I was looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. And, uh, and then we'll go to verse 15 in the same chapter. But I just want to kind of give you the backstory on this. And Peter's talking to the women in the church, and he's saying, can you go up a couple of verses and let's just see what it says. Uh, yeah, right there. So he's saying, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair and the wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Now you can go back to, uh, verse 4. So Peter was bringing correction to the women in the church. Now, if I was going to try to cross the bridge from there to now, what I would try to tell you is he was basically telling them, don't try to make yourself dutied up and look like the world in order to try to win your husband's heart. Instead, if, in other words, if you're in a situation where your husband may not be a believer and you're trying to win your husband's heart, the way that you do that is not by looking like the world or acting like the world. But it says in verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So what he's saying right there is, is that in, in whatever God's plan crucifies the old man, resurrects the new man. Now the Holy Spirit's living in the new man and the new man submits to the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit as the mirror of the word has its way in their heart. They realize my attitude and my behavior, just like a husband is supposed to, but right now we're talking about the women because that's what was in there. My attitude and my behavior needs to reflect what's in. See, Peter's saying it's in you. Because if Christ is in you, then it's in you. Amen. And, you, and we, need to, we need to allow that to be what comes out of us. That, that hidden man of the heart. Amen. And, and look at verse 15. He says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, Jesus wants that. Jesus the heart belongs to him. The heart is interconnected. It's part of the soul, but I really do believe that it's a bridge between the soul and the spirit. 
Because see, whenever that spirit where you've been regenerated, whenever that, whenever that spirit starts to cross over that bridge of the heart and it starts to infiltrate the mind and it starts to infiltrate the will and it starts to infiltrate the emotions, because, because your soul is, is a little different than your spirit. I'm not trying to keep segregating them that much, but I'm trying to make a point. Your will, your wants, your thoughts versus God's. Amen. But when you give him that special place in your heart, now your mind lies up. Your thoughts become his thoughts. You homologia. <laughs> you say, you say, say. You say the same thing he says according to his word. Amen. Your thoughts become his thoughts. Your, his will. I'm sorry. His thoughts become your thoughts and his will becomes your will. The will of God's got a will for your life. Yes, yes. His wants become your wants. Yes. That's, that's important. That's, that's the whole process of the new covenant. Yes. You dying so that you can live. Amen. You dying to yourself so that Christ can be formed in you. I keep saying, we're, we're kind of quoting that scripture where Paul said that, how I travail till Christ be formed in you. Amen. Man, John. John said something today that was so good when he said it. I'm sorry. Let's see if I can find it. What a masterful potter he is. He knows exactly the perfect pressure to apply to his clay to mold it into a masterpiece. How blessed we are to be a part of the museum of God where all of his sculptures are put on display for all to see the brilliance and power of the master artist. What? Dude, that's so awesome. Like he's sculpting us. Yes, yes. He, he's chiseling away at all those things. And, and the more of us that's removed, yes. <laughs> the more of Christ that's seen. And it's like the museum of God that was put on display because now the glory of Jesus yes. is being revealed to yes. a lost and a dying world. The real, when the real Jesus show up, somebody, hallelujah. Well, whenever we learn to yield to him, submit to him, and we allow the Holy Spirit to have his work in us, it's going to work. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Moving on to the next one, the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let me say that one more time. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become called the sons of God. I put this in my notes. After all, the son of God made peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. After all, the Son of God made peace. We have to make peace with God through Him before we can ever make peace with man. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I was in the jail preaching, and I said... I said, just slow down one second. Repeat after me. I, go ahead, repeat after me. I am justified by faith. God declares me righteous. And we repeated that about three or four times. And I tried to explain to them again and again. And they're like, hallelujah. Right? God declares you righteous. If you've put your faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, because the first Adam caused sin, I don't know, before you even said that other text, uh, it was already it was already in there. I, the first Adam made the whole world full of corruption and disobedience. Romans chapter five. But the last Adam, uh, that one act of offense caused the whole world to be corrupted with sin and that one act of obedience yes, that yes. gives the opportunity for people to receive his righteousness. Oh, oh so good. He's so good. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. And whenever we receive his righteousness, it's a gift. We talk about that a lot, right? I've preached this many, many times, but on Calvary, an exchange took place. 
He took my sin upon him. He became the sin offering. And, and, he, and he gave me the gift of his righteousness, Romans 5, 17. Righteousness has, his name, has a name. What's his name? Yes. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so, blessed are the peacemakers. So before we're ever going to make peace with a man, we've got to make peace with God. Amen? Amen? So with regard to making peace with man, we have to take into account what he said before. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, and blessed are those that are pure in heart. Because a prideful heart will not lower self in order to make peace. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Prideful heart won't do it. It's going to hold on to its position. It's going to say it's right, thinks it's right, refuses, refuses to lower self. See, Jesus lowered himself and became a man. If we had time, I'd go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. In the Greek, you don't have to go there. But in the Greek language, it says, it talks about him. He lowered himself. It's the idea of the Greek scholar, Kenneth Lee says, he condescended and he bypassed angels so that he could redeem the sons of Abraham. How do you think them angels? We don't want to get into all that right now, the fallen angels and the Nephilim and all that, too much stuff to get into. But let me just say this. How do you think them angels felt when, when Jesus, how, you think that didn't embitter them even more? What about Haman? I was thinking about Haman. Like, you know, whenever he had the gallows ready and he's thinking he's about to get glorified and instead he puts Mordecai, King Ahaz, your ears, puts Mordecai on that horse and the next thing you know, Haman gets caught and he's on the gallows that he built. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about an unwillingness. I'm talking about pride and an unwillingness to forgive. It's something that's not right on the inside of the heart. And unfortunately, and why, why do you think you know so much, preacher? Because I've been here. I've been in this place before where I had ought in my heart and I knew that I was conflicted with another human being. And I'm here to tell you right now, and listen, I also have read this word and let me tell you something I've learned about other people. It does not matter whether or not you think that they're not going to respond to you appropriately. The Lord didn't ask you that. Amen. The Lord said, if you think, if your brother has ought against you, you are to go to him. Oh, he might think, he might think this about, they might think that about me. The Lord never even gave you any permission to think that way. He said, if your brother has ought against you, leave the altar. Don't even, don't even leave your sacrifice at the altar, he said. Go make it right. With that person, then bring your sacrifice back to me. That's powerful, my friend. Right? That's very, very powerful. And, and, and I have called people up. Because I can tell. You think people can't tell when, they got, when you got all against them? I, I don't know. Maybe some people don't have any discernment. I don't know. But I can feel it. I feel it all up in me. You know? And I've called people before. Nobody in this church, but I've called I've called some people before, and I'm like, man, you, is everything okay? Oh, yeah, everything's fine, man, everything's fine, everything's fine. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not going to tell them that, because now I'm going to be calling the liar. They really got one in their heart. <laughs> but I tried. I tried. I, I said, well, you know, the Bible says if, you, if your brother has one against you, to go to them. So I'm trying to do that. And, you know, if you, what'll happen is if you're not prepared, that might even make you, if you're, if the more spiritually mature we become, the better we handle these things, right? So I'm just kind of like letting you know the scripture says for you to do that. But if you're expecting a response that's going to make you happy, you're missing the point. Because he's not really asking you to humble yourself to them. He's really asking you to humble yourself under his hand, right? And, and, and we have to really be able to get to the place where when they don't respond like we think that they should, that we're still okay with the Lord. And we allow Him to deal with our heart and that we truly pray for those that despitefully use us. And, and listen, to, that's spiritual growth. Beautiful things can happen because our Father in Heaven does beautiful things. Even, uh, you know, we just read that earlier. Amen. Amen. So yield, y yield yourself to the Lord, right? To God's Word. Allow your flesh to try to be broken. Or, I put it in here, or cling to your own will. I had this in here too before our little journey last night where I talked about the rod of Moses. The rod of the Lord is a beautiful instrument, right? At one moment it looks insignificant and weak and in the midst of a horrible circumstance and then you do with it what he says and the sea is open and you walk in newfound freedom. But the way open for you 
but the way opened for you because you did it his way and not your own. Freedom, the doorway to freedom is when we do it God's way. Not us trying to manufacture it. Not us trying to hold on to what we want to hold on to and refusing to let go and refusing to let God have his way. That freedom doesn't come that way. That's You're staying in disobedience. You're like, yeah, but I'm not looking at internet pornography. I'm not drinking no more. I don't smoke marijuana. I'm not, blah, blah. but you're holding bitterness in your heart. You're, you have ought against your brother. You refuse to yield to the will of God because you're like, I'm going to live in my will and not God's will. That is disobedience. He's not moved. That is pride. The scripture says he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, to the mighty hand of God, and in due time he will exalt you. Amen? See, this is the work of the cross is what I'm trying to tell you. We can sit here and we can talk about the cross this, the cross that, the message of the cross, and we can have all this in our brain, and we can regurgitate and quote the scriptures, but the reality of it is, is that what Jesus is talking about right here is where the rubber beats the rubber. Whenever you allow the cross to deal with that pride in your heart, when you allow the cross to deal with that awe in your heart, when you allow the work of Calvary to crucify your flesh so that the, so that Christ, the love of and the, the love and nature of Jesus is being formed in you. Praise God. He's beautiful. Amen. All right, number eight. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A person that is not a peacemaker pursues with persecution. Look at look at Galatians 4:28 through 31. Now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now that's the deep stuff. He had to spend a lot of time in the book of Galatians to really, but he, what he's saying is, he's saying this, he's saying that the child of Hagar is typ, typifies the flesh, and that the child of, of Sarah typifies the spirit, because it's supernatural promise of God being revealed, versus the work of man, alright, and, and the Judaizers were coming in there, and they were, they were messing up Paul's message, and they were saying, you got to add the, the circumcision to your faith. So they're preaching a message of flesh right there. But look, in the midst of it is causing persecution. They're coming against Paul's message and they're coming against the truth of the gospel. Okay? And that's what we need to understand is that persecution is always of the flesh. It's, persecution is not of the spirit. To persecute literally means to pursue with hostility. So when you get into a situation and you feel like you become hostile, can you feel hostility in your heart? Because some people do a better job of hiding it outwardly. I've learned that through the years. I don't do a very good job of hiding my emotions outwardly. Pretty much with me, you, what you see is what you get. But, I, but he, he's still working on me. Hallelujah. But what I, but what I want to know, what I want to tell you though is this, is that you should be able to feel it in your spirit. That feeling of irritation and confusion, and, right? That's not of the Lord. There's no purpose of love in persecution. It's birthed in the flesh and acted in the flesh. And certainly it is likely that when a believer believes they are acting in the spirit, they don't know, think it's the flesh, but, it's, but if it's dissected according to the word, persecution is hostile towards God and the things of God. The flesh will always persecute the spirit. They're contrary one to the other. It's very important that we understand the difference. And then when persecution comes, we won't be surprised. We won't be so offended. We will realize the attack and be empowered to be a peacemaker in God's eyes. 
as long as we are concerned about our own reputation and ready to take our own defense, it will be hard to be a real peacemaker and suffer persecution in a godly way. Now, one last thing I want to say about, about that is this. When, you're, when you feel like you're suffering persecution and you feel like somebody's coming against you, make sure that when the persecution comes that you allow God to examine your own heart. That is so important. And it is something that I promise you I have learned to do over the last several years. Every single time I have ever been in a situation, and there's been a few of conflict and different things like that that have happened through these years since I've been serving the Lord and I've been a vocal Christian, right? And what I do is, I'm like, I examine my heart. And I, many times I can see where there was something he was wanting to show me most of the time, at least a little something. Right? That he wants to show me through it. And so I'm just trying to encourage you. When you feel like people are coming against you in hostility, don't think that it's all their fault. Make sure you're looking at, at, at your own heart and letting him deal with you and pray for that other person and let the Lord deal with them. Amen. But if your heart's bitter, it's not going to work like that. You know, I'm about to close here in a second, but uh, I heard someone say the other day, and it was good when they said it. There's a big difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. See, many times, the, in most cases, the peacemaker has to humble and lower their self. And once peace is made, actually, we were listening to a message on the way over there. And a brother, Luke Pogue, out of Mississippi, I'd like to get him to come preach for us soon. He's an amazing preacher. And he said something kind of like this. It wasn't exactly, but that... Sometimes after peace is made, the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper is sometimes it's best to stay away a little bit. What I, what I mean is this. If every time you're in the presence of a person, conflict is arising, and, you've, and peace has been made, and I'm not trying to tell you to stay away from your family. I'm not trying to tell you to leave your husband. I'm not trying to tell you not to even love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. What I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes the way people are behaving and the way that they're speaking to you and the things that they're doing or vice versa, something is not something's not gelling. And almost every time you get together with them, there's conflict. Maybe it's better just to kind of distance yourself. Yes. I'm not saying that you never come back and you never try to and you pray for them. But see, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Let me let me be clear about this. OK, it's, it's better to keep peace by staying clear. But let's let's make sure we understand this. If you have ought or bitterness in your heart while you're staying away, that's not keeping peace. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? People are like, oh, no, I got to just stay my distance. But but yet they got bitterness in their heart. No, that's not keeping peace. That's nurturing bitterness. What I'm trying to say is, is that legit you wanted to have peace, but you're noticing that every time that that every time you're getting around in this situation, and it's a situation that you don't have to always be in, okay, that some kind of conflict is arising and that there's irritation in your spirit. You need to let the Lord deal with you, but you also need to understand something, something's not right with this situation. That's my rec that's my recommendation for you. And I mean, if that doesn't bear witness with your spirit, then then go to the Lord. But I'm, I'm just trying, I'm not trying to get anybody, I want to be clear on this, I'm not trying to get anybody to avoid their brother or sister in the Lord. We're supposed to be able to walk in unity. But I'm trying to make a point that sometimes, every time you're around a person that conflict is happening, sometimes you can do better by staying away and really praying for that person, really asking the Lord to move in their heart and in their life. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. And 12 singers, musicians, maybe y'all can come up. We'll close out with a song if we can. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> we'll worship the Lord going out. Praise God. We worshiped him before, before the, uh, the word. Amen. Jesus got his glory tonight. Praise God. His word. Amen. So, so these are the last two verses of this part. It says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And that's why it's important for us to um, that's why it's important for us to allow the Lord to examine our heart.
Because we might think that they're accusing us falsely, but they might actually be saying the truth, right? And, and the word revile means to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. But in this case, it says that, that they're doing it falsely, right? They're saying things about you and doing things about you that aren't really true. But again, you got you to gotta ask the Lord, could it be true? Amen. Do y'all do y'all do that? You don't have to shake your head. I'll keep my head down. Do y'all do that? It's a good question. Do you do that? Whenever you feel yourself in a conflict with someone, do you ever question, could you be part of the problem? Yes, yes. Because yes. you yes. should. Yes. Amen. I'm glad you. <laughs> All right, Matthew 5 and 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If I would have had more time, we would have looked at Oh, Micaiah, and how he was persecuted for telling the truth. Amen. That was a good story. Praise God. Go home and read it out of Kings. Whenever Ahab, when Micaiah, uh, Ahab wanted a word, let me just tell you. You can go ahead and strum a little bit for me. When, when Ahab wanted a word, for, Jehoshaphat said, Is there not another prophet? Is there not another prophet we can talk to? He's like, Man, you got this guy, Micaiah. But he doesn't never tell me what I want. He is, boy, he is a man. I don't remember what he said. And Joseph Hosea said, you shouldn't say that. They talk about the prophet like that. He's like, well, okay, just go on and get him. And I can't tell you that this really happened, but this is what I imagine in my heart. Because Ahab knew that he was, he, he wasn't telling, he wasn't really telling the truth, right? And all the other prophets had told him, man, you're going to win. You know, one of them guys comes in there with some horns. With these horns, you're going to gore your enemy. And then, and then, and then, all of a sudden, Micaiah comes in there and, and he says, "Okay, give me the word of the Lord." And he's like, "Go forward and win." This is what I think he looks like. I can't prove it, but go forward and take the go. You know, go against your enemy for the Lord has put them in your hand. And you know, and, and, and then Ahab, like obviously, he had some kind of. Uh, demeanor about it because Ahab's like I told you you need to always tell me the truth he's like alright you want to know the truth a lying spirit is in these prophets I saw it in heaven the heaven I saw in the heavens and the Lord let a, a lying spirit come into the mouth of your prophets and you are going to be destroyed if you go into war and Ahab said don't he, Ahab said grab him and throw him in prison until I come back and Micaiah's last words to him was this if you ever return, then the word of the Lord was not true out of my mouth. And I'm just trying to say that so many times people don't really want the truth, right? I don't even lost my point to all that. Oh, they persecuted the prophets. Threw him in jail because they didn't want to hear the truth. So whenever you speak truth and people come against you for speaking truth, whether it's in your family, whether it's at work, or whether it's me from behind the pulpit and they want to persecute for speaking truth, then, then Lord help them and Lord help, you, help us. Amen? Praise God. Praise God.